Also, at any rate, I'm going to go ahead and um, mute you all, I believe, and um, and then we'll we'll get going um, here pretty quickly. I'll begin with prayer and. Um, All right. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for tonight's lesson. We ask you, Lord, that you would uh, enlighten our minds, help the truth of your word to sink in deeply, help us to reason from bedrock principles that, and premises that uh, allow us stability, absolutes. We pray, Lord, for all those that... Um, are facing all in our country and around the world that are facing such pressures that we haven't seen all at the same time, like a tsunami. So God, we just pray that you'd uh, enlighten our minds, help us tonight, Lord, and give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are, we are working on uh, now a lesson 11, believe it or not. Uh, it's called in the facts manual, individuality and serving the Lord God. And I would highlight this, that what we're talking about is that serving the Lord is an individual activity. Um, groups only serve God together as each individual serves the Lord. God has designed it that way. That it's an individual responsibility. And I might say right at the outset, though, um, and we'll contrast this, that we have had a tendency over the last hundred years in America, and particularly in the church, to push Christianity to a group activity, so that all the things that are corporate uh, take precedent over the things that are individual. And the corporate is necessary, don't get me wrong on that, that we need to corporately be together to worship and whatnot. But the most important thing is our individual walk with God, and that is the critical area. We serve God individually, and as we join together with other people voluntarily in covenant and in consent, we certainly increase our impact. There's no question about it. At the same time, when you shift it over to the collective, as we've been talking about, and uh, you make it more of a collective, we end up reducing the responsibility of individuals. And this has been our critical issue. Today, uh, if there's any issue, where do people look to solve the problem? instantly. The government, away from themselves. When God created it in such a way that each individual can make an impact. You know, when we look at this uh, and we review these ideas, we certainly see, we're, since we're dual citizens and the flow of government begins in the individual heart, and that Christ is Savior and King, and that we're created uniquely in God's image, and only we individually can love, like we talked about before. Governments don't love. Law doesn't love. Law prepares for love. Law directs us, but law is not a substitute for love, and it has a different function. And I think as we go through this, um, we will see this. I'm, I'm going to use some quotes from the lesson, like I've done in the past, and um, think about this verse again. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? When you think about this, Jesus is comparing one soul with the whole world. Now, he's not talking about all the people in the world. He's talking all the systems, all the things, the possessions, everything we could have. And Jesus makes it pretty clear, one soul is worth more than all the things, notoriety, glamour, that you could ever get, all, worth all, more than all the money that you could ever have. Uh, what a powerful statement that Jesus makes. And here, Reverend Levi Hart, that's quoted by Russ Walton, uh, makes this statement. The importance of man will deeply impress the mind, which attentively considers it. The present and future existence are, both of them, highly interesting, and especially the latter. The various endowments of the mind of man in connection with his immortality render his existence important in the highest degree. Such is the worth of the human soul that in the estimate of unerring wisdom, it is not to be exchanged for the whole world. Now think of how many things today are we, um, are we given and challenged with 
that constantly tell us the devaluing of the individual. Think about it. Just think of abortion for a moment and think of how it devalues the life. Uh, it's traded on the altar of convenience or uh, all other kinds of things, whether knowingly, unknowingly, conscious or unconscious, we know that that takes place. We know that the value of one individual is often uh, not considered to be valuable. If it, uh, We've seen before that the other systems of government do not respect the minority in the room. If one person objects, it's as if, hey, come on, get with the program, really? Uh, come on, everybody else is in agreement. Why can't you be in agreement? There has to be constantly in Christianity the willingness to hear the one, the two, that uh, might object. Not by force. We're not talking about uh, trying to coerce people, but the idea is the value of one opinion, uh, the idea of listening to one another. Uh, very important in individuality and very important in our system. Our system of government is so unique because we des the system was designed to respect the rights of minorities as well as the majority because everybody had the same rights given by God. And so it's important, again, the value of one soul. Another comment, another pr key principle that we could confirm here is that God created individuals, not groups. Think about it. Uh, Russ Walton says, God did not create man by the numbers in the multitudes. He could have spoken and brought forth thousands, millions of human beings all at once, as numerous as the fish of the sea, plentiful as the birds in the sky, as many as the beasts of the earth, but he didn't. Think about this in the creation account. It's given that God created the fish of the sea. There's just millions and millions instantly created with his word. The animals instantly created. The stars, the heavens instantly created. The fowls, the birds. Then when he came to man, he created one man. And then he created one woman. Just think how significant that is. That's why the creation story is so powerful to begin with. That's why creation is such a critical fundamental principle of the Christian faith and theology. Russ Walton goes on to say he created one man, Adam, and from that one man, one woman, Eve, he made them two who became one, Genesis 2, 24, to be fruitful and multiply. Through them, he extended the gift of human life. Through them, he populated the earth with mankind one by one. Therefore, there are no group rights, for by definition, if there's a group right, it's a privilege. For instance, you know, we have today, we say the rights of, and we name groups. You know, the rights of this minority group, that minority group. Do you realize the moment you identify a right in a group, it cheapens it. Because once you give it to one person, you can't give it, then you have to give it to everybody. And you have to realize that people are saying, hey, if they got that privilege, then I want that privilege. You know, if you, if you walk into a store, and they say, wow, hey, the first person in this morning gets a discount, 50% off anything they choose. Well, that's pretty clear. You know that's what it is. But what if you're the first one in and they said, oh, I'll change my mind. I know that's written. But we're going to give 50% to everybody who has blue eyes or everybody. In other words, the moment you begin to change that, once if it's written and you follow it, fine. I guess for one, one activity, that's fine. But God didn't create groups. He didn't create multitudes of individuals. He had created the individual first and then through them come into groups. And that's why rights have to be reasoned from individuals to groups. Otherwise, you have every kind of group vying for some kind of government handout. A God created man, a free moral agent. This is also different and distinct from animals. God did not create robots. He created man. And it was and is his will that man expresses individuality. And keep in mind, whenever the word man is used, it's generic. It means men and women. Each individual is created in the image of God, and each individual has a full and independent value placed directly upon them by their creator. No two people are exactly alike. Not even identical twins. God placed within mankind, men and women, infinite variation. What do we mean? If you read in the facts uh, or the paperback or the notebook, you'll see he goes into the millions of cells and genetic makeup of individuals and DNA and the amazing part of that. And um, this is a quote from the text. When God created Adam, he endowed him with the potential 
for all characteristics of all races and all individuals. Think about it. The first man and woman, when they got married, they had within their own genes every potential characteristic of all the races throughout all the years. God created it that way so that variety is the spice of life. That's who he is. And each individual has worth. They do not have worth because they're part of a subgroup. They have worth because of who they are. And that's imperative. That's important. We've had to do that because we haven't respected those rights. But that's not what God's intent was. And think of progress. What moves civilization forward? What is that gives us innovation? The key to progress is the innovation of unique creativity. From spirituality to economics, God's variety can meet every need. Think about it this way. I, I was teaching economics one time, and I, I was speaking before a group, and I said this. Because I believe in God, and um, God places in every community, hamlet, neighborhood, city, the gifts and talents in the people that live there to create every kind of business that would meet every kind of need. Think about it. God has, some people love to do one thing. Some love to do another. God has that creativity built into individual human beings. When we begin to be deceived and thinking it has to come from the collective, we sit around and wait for someone else to do something for us. We sit around and wait for someone to deliver us something, to someone to give it to us. Instead, the individual can begin and move forward. Like F.A. Harper says, quoted in the text, human capacity for independent thought and action when coupled with variation throughout the universe, that's what gives rise to progress. And there is progress only to the extent that this capacity is allowed under liberty. Do you see that when God said to replenish the earth, the idea was to protect liberty, to have liberty to release your talents. That's the whole idea. And individuals that can release their productivity and talents that's what makes an economic system so powerful. See, today, the natural tendency is to say, we have to have the right environment. We have to give the right amount of government stimulus. Oh, otherwise, people won't do anything. No, that actually hinders it. Uh, with individuality means that the individual has that capacity. And if you give them freedom and not punish them for productivity, wow, you'll find that to be the case. I'm amazed. And how, for instance, I'm amazed at how many pizza shops there are. Think about it. In every, every, every town, because there's a need. People love pizza. They love getting those pizzas. So all these shops create, these people who they just love twirling that dough. They just love doing this all day long. That's not something I would crave doing. And yet, think about it, the variety of shops that come forward, the variety to meet a need, because there's a, a craving of, the, of that need. And if that craving is there, you're going to have it. I, you know, we could go on and on. Dunkin' Donuts, all these other shops, because people have that need. That's creativity. It's unique. What is the opposite of individuality, though? Sameness, uniformity. Uniformity produces stagnation. It's static. It's oppressive society. The individual only becomes a digit, a unit. He lives in quiet desperation, waiting to be noticed. This is a problem. Now, it's interesting that Russ goes into this with the individual who's studied the world of the social insects. Now, I, I remember years ago, I, I don't know where I got the book, but I got this book by a scientist who went into the world of the social insect. I remember reading about, I loved looking as a kid at a praying mantis. I loved looking at it because I thought, wow, it's awesome that he was named because the front two legs of that thing looks like he's praying. Well, then I found out once I studied him that it's really his function is to P-R-E-Y. He is a phenomenal, vociferous foe. And it changed my whole understanding. See, God has all these insects that we can see um, as, as stories for us. They're tremendously, they have instinct, but they also show us something. You know, the, uh, the, the Bible tells us that the satanic kingdom is a dictatorship. 
Uh, we see in Ephesians 2, 2, it says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, by nature, children of wrath. And the devil said to Jesus, all this authority I will give you if you will just fall down and worship me. And of course, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Because you see, the idea is this, I'll give you all the collective stuff. But you see, one soul is worth more than the whole world. And you know, the world of social insects, this is the way um, it's written in the text. The ways of the social insect world have been the envy of dictators both large and small, who would like to ascend to the throne of the queen bee, in which every human would become subservient to the dictator's own wishes. God did not create man to be an insect. He created man a living soul, a free moral agent with an innate sense of moral value. You know, I studied the ant many years ago, and the ant is tremendously powerful. If you could make the ant the size of a man, he could, he could be, he'd be superhuman. The ant, and yet the ant has that a tremendous amount of self-government, so to speak, instinct within it. And yet, it's a colony that takes no time off. It's a colony with has no respect for individuality, though people have certain different jobs. In fact, it's a world of uniformity. Uh, the, listen to what it said in the, the, the text here. These insect colonies are highly materialistic. Moral and spiritual considerations play no part. They are coldly harsh in their purpose and performance. They are inhuman and wholly lack anything like the warmth of human love and compassion. Population is rigidly controlled. And I remember reading when I taught biology these things and the horror of the students when they realize, as I continue the quote, they kill those that do not work and ruthlessly destroy the ill and the aged. Full employment, high production is maintained. Yeah, because that's exactly what happens in the insect. If you get too old and you're not productive, they just go over and kill you. They eliminate you. You're done. A high national income is maintained by imposing compulsion of labor at an early age, by compulsion of long work weeks, prohibiting vacation. When have you ever heard of an ant going on vacation? When have you ever heard of a bee being able to do that? No. And without pay. Now, I know it's somewhat facetious, but here's the idea. God has created these things to show us what life would be like. And folks, if you would read this to someone who lived under the Soviet Union, who's someone who lived in Venezuela recently, someone who's lived in Cuba, someone who's lived in nations that are totalitarian, they would tell you this is not far from the truth. And what are these political systems that enforce uniformity? Well, R.J. Rushton, the, the theologian, said that due to the fall, man's urge to dominion is now a perverted one. He no longer is an exercise of power under God to his glory, but a desire to be God. History, therefore, has seen the long and bitter consequences of men's perverted urge to dominion. History is a long tale of horror in which man has sought power and dominion as an end in itself. Remember, we talked about this, that right from the beginning of the fall, there was this immediate competition on who was going to be in control. God gave the dominion charter to mankind to take dominion of the earth, and this was not to dominate or to di be dictators, but to steward the earth, but not to dominate other human beings. And the systems that rise, that socialism, whose name came in 1810 and 20 uh, around the world, was the state control of labor. So the labor you, the labor you give, which is internal and subjective, the labor you give is valuable. Your labor means something. I used to tell, tell students when I teach economics, I would say, listen, the labor you put into learning this course and that you put into your exam, the labor you do can't be measured. It can't just be measured even in your grade. You know how much labor you're putting in there. But when the state begins to put a value on that labor, it's di dictatorial control. That labor should be respected by other people in its value. Marxism is the state control of employers and pricing and income. Communism builds on that, the state control of land and all your possessions. And fascism is a hybrid. When you hear the word fascism, it's the idea of the state partnering with select private businesses. That's the root of fascism, to produce a certain group. See, see when government selectively chooses winners and losers in the economy. 
and selectively chooses some private businesses to partner with, they have an advantage. Wouldn't you agree? Government partners with them, they got an advantage. They got an advantage in both their income and their employment and their pricing when government goes. But remember, fascism means you selectively choose which businesses will be around when the others are exterminated. It's a, uh, it's a uh, fascism is that kind of a hybrid. And these are important terms because folks, money people just look at it and say, oh, those are just history book terms. They have no application. Uh -huh. Look, the last few weeks, they're taking on a whole new application because it's all around us. So the Dominion Charter empowered individuality. This is initially what we might call the creation mandate. God gave men and women the mandate to steward the earth. It was to be carried out primarily by individuals, which we see in Genesis 4, 5, and 6. Using their gifts and talents, individuals would inspire others to work with them in teams for productivity. But the inspiration goes from the individual to the group. We don't negate the group, but individuals often inspire others to follow them. Lord Acton once said, power corrupts, and you've heard it, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That's a sin of commission, the act of aggression against God. But Edmund Burke once said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. This is the sin of omission, an act of passivity in the face of evil. Now, we're going to develop this a lot more in the next lesson. But these two sins are powerful. We often think only of the sin of commission. We think that um, here we are and, hey, I didn't do anything bad today. I didn't scream at anybody. I didn't hit anybody. I didn't, I actually, I didn't, I didn't use a curse word. I'm pretty good. I'm okay. But the real issue is how many things did you leave out that God led for you to do? Uh, because otherwise we'd just be passive. And... Um, that's one of the things we have to recognize when we're challenged, when, and the issues are challenging us, folks, it's gonna to come to all of our front doors, so to speak. These issues are gonna come and we cannot remain silent. We cannot remain passive. And there are times because if good men do nothing, I was sharing today with this group of leaders and we were just highlighting these bills on required vaccines that are seemingly moving through state legislatures and eventually, potentially, at least through the nation. And I was saying, you know, the, the difficult problem about all this is that we got to speak up and we've got to we got to tell people they should be registered to vote. Do you, do you realize that less than 50 percent of the evangelical church is even registered to vote and then less than 30 percent of that 50 percent even vote? I made the statement today, but it's through the sin of omission, we're not being taken over by tyranny in America. We're giving the nation over to tyranny. We're giving it away. And that's the problem because we haven't raised an objection. And it doesn't have to be in a negative way. So when we apply individuality, we could make some of these statements. Internally, it's a direct application of God's sovereignty in the heart of the individual. We might say God is sovereign, he's in control of everything that's happening. That's true. But where does it get applied? Is he sovereign inside us? I keep having to ask myself a question. Lord, if you're the sovereign of my life, then when you speak, I need to move. When you tell me to do something, I need to do it. When your word says it, I need to give an account. I need to be responsible and have accountability. For faith without works is dead. Our faith, will, our faith will produce individual and unique works. We're all different. Externally, individually means that the civil government that is based on the in principle of individuality recognizes the importance and the dignity of the individual, each individual. Not the, see, it used to be each individual should voluntarily think of the common good, what's best for everybody. That has been switched now. When you move to collectivism, it's each individual should give up their opinions and simply go with the group. That's very different. The common good means I choose to be active in seeking the common good, the unity of all, rather than my voice isn't anything that's necessary. As, it, as the statement goes on, the civil government that denies or violates the principle of individuality refuses the fact that we were made in God's image. That's true. As Christians, we're to work for, construct, and support that form of civil government that's based on God's laws and principles. Think about it today. 
I, it'll become very evident I'm going to use this vaccine issue as a current issue to apply this principle. And you'll see very clearly that when we look at a forced vaccine, we're not respecting the individuality of people, either physically or spiritually. It's because we no longer think, and I'm saying we, uh, civil government and legislators, no longer think that each individual is a creation of God. We've been so taught about evolution that somehow we just we evolve, we're, we're no more than the animals. And that's not a disparage of the animals. Man was created to have a higher destiny. You see, these things are important. And America was found, formed on biblical individuality. As George Bancroft wrote in his three-volume history, first published in 1852, the, um, uh, he, he wrote this idea of the, the rise of, of the um, United States and the formation of the United States. The rise of the Republic was Richard Frothingham, but he wrote this, from Protestantism, there came forth a principle of all pervading energy, the common possession of civilized man, the harbinger of new changes in the state, the life-giving truth of the Reformation was the right of private judgment. The separate man was growing aware of the inherent right to be the unfettered culture and enjoyment of his whole moral and intellectual being. You have to realize what it was like when Wycliffe translated the Bible from Latin to English. The individual finally read the Bible for themselves. And all of a sudden they began to say, wait a second, I don't agree with this. I have an opinion. You see, the whole world had gone monarchical. The whole world had, was in that kind of darkness. And the Reformation in, encouraged individuals, individuals to follow God. Individuality was the groundwork of new theories of politics, ethics, and industry. All these things came. And of course, the works of George Bancroft, uh, some of them are reproduced in that book, Foundation for American Christian Education's book, The Christian History of the American Revolution. And and of course, that can be gotten on that website, face.net. Now, individuality leads to productivity. Now, George Bancroft goes on and he says this. Now, this is, by the way, one of the buildings at Williamsburg. And, um, and so it's, uh, I just use this because it's such a good picture of this. Each individual being cut from all means of rising to importance, but by his own personal talents, was encouraged to make the most of those which he was endowed. Prospects of this kind excited emulation, produced an enterprising, laborious set of men, not easily overcome by difficulties, full of projects for bettering their condition. Think about this. You had no products in a wilderness. You're building a society from scratch. You can't just go to the store and buy something that doesn't exist. You begin to produce it. You produce it from scratch. The beautiful thing, if you ever go to Williamsburg, is because it produces the colonial philosophy so well. Every home had attached to it a smaller building that was their business. Business was home-based. Some were blacksmiths. Some people culled the crops in a certain way. Some repaired wagons, whatever they were, but they walked from their home right into their business and their store. They were productive. They met all the needs of the small city based on their individuality and their talents. They were encouraged to make the most of it. Nobody was going to do it for you. If you had a problem and you couldn't fix it, you had to go and make it from scratch. And see, we've come a long way from that and that individuality. Also, there was an individual love of liberty. And in the rise of the Republic of the United States by Frothingham, he says, without the infection of wild political and social theories, they were animated by a love of liberty, a spirit of personal independence unknown to the great body of people in Europe while at the same time recognizing the law which united the individual to the family and to the society in which he is appointed to live. So think of this, the gifts, the creativity that God's going to give out from the individual up. That's why we say bottom up. We just say from the individual up uh, into the society, from the internal to the external. All those things are not merely rhetoric, rhetorical phrases. It's the way God designed to bless humanity and bless villages. And this is what is being often not respected. As historian David Ramsey said, and he was contemporary with the revolution, he was one of the two, history, main or two historians that wrote primary source documents on the American Revolution. The other was Mercy Otis Warren from the North and David Ramsey from the South. He said they, the founding fathers, looked up to heaven 
as the source of their rights and claimed not from the promise of kings, but from the parent of the universe. You see, that's what made them so unique. Individually, they looked up to God. They said, God is the one that gave us our individual rights. And of course, this painting is of that first prayer of the Continental Congress there. Um, and, and, and kneeling before God and going to prayer. The Bible, it's interesting because the Bible is what produced that individuality, that concept. They, the people of that day who were reading the Bible for the first time, were beginning to understand the importance of each individual. Verna Hall writes, in God's sight, individuality. We're catching a vision of what Christian civil government might be when governor and governed agreed to bow to the sovereignty of God. They were beginning to grasp the fact that all civil laws, as well as ecclesiastical laws, were to be subject to God's law of liberty. You see, this is powerful because when the individual recognizes this, both the governor and the governed were under the same law. That's important. You know, when you apply that, Russ Walton leaves a chart there about applying the Dominion Charter, and he takes phrases from Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply, of course, that's preserving and protecting life. That's a job we have, to stand up for the right of life. Replenish the earth. Well, that's liberty to produce tools and technology. And we say, uh, you know, businesses should be free to produce those things. To subdue or own the earth, steward your own property. That's how we begin to do that. When we steward our own property, we set an example for others. Have dominion over the fish and the seas, the Bible says. Well, those are the times when we learn to farm the seas and the lakes and the water and keep the water clean and for future generations. To have, to, to have dominion over the fowl of the air, to raise poultry, and even by extension, air travel as real technology of conquering the air. Over the cattle of the field, develop healthy herds for meat, poultry plants, and whatnot, and, and sane and and, and proper stewardship over the beasts of the earth, the breed, horsepower on land. Do you know that these things from the Dominion Mandate often inspired invention, even of automobiles, aircraft, and others? This was a powerful because it was our job as men and women to steward the earth, to remain in harmony with God's laws as revealed in creation. That's critical. And we remember his marvelous works, which he has done. See, the posture of all of us is to look at what God made, and how can we take what God made and reproduce it on the earth? This is truly the Dominion Charter. And can you imagine what a nation would be like if the individual was released under God's law, not an anarchy, not to do anything you want to do whenever you want to do it, but the idea of releasing it under the laws of creation, how powerful that would be. What kind of a society? And we already have one of the freest societies in the earth. But it was even freer. Do you realize in 1830 when Alexis de Tocqueville came to America, wrote, wrote America and wrote his book, Democracy in America, and we got it from a foreigner, but we knew that? Just about everyone in America in 1830 worked for themselves. Nobody worked for anybody else. They all owned their own businesses. Oh, you can't say nobody, but the idea is very, very few. Because remember, people had 10 to 12 children. Their family was like a dynasty. They had all the workers they could use, and they bought 600 acres and stuff, and they divided it. And you had these family dynasties that began with all these kinds of businesses. There was very little crime. Uh, most people had no locks on their doors. In fact, when you read through that book, you realize, wow, what a liberty that could take place in this case. It wasn't perfect, but Alexis de Tocqueville said it was pretty quiet on a Sunday because where do you think everybody was? They were in church. And if he didn't go to church, you'd have to read the sermon in the newspaper. So what about these required vaccines? Now, I've been watching this kind of an issue for a while now, um, kind of suspecting like others that um, uh, this idea of a forced vaccine might come. And um, now they've started in Massachusetts. Now, just to give you a quick background, um, that um, all throughout now, right now in the United States, there are five states that have removed the medical or, and or the religious exemption. See, vaccines always had a medical and religious exemption. And I, that those, those were always uh, people who would say, listen, not everybody's immune system is healthy enough to take the vaccine. Remember, you're giving the person part of the disease. And if you have a, a compromised immune system, you don't want to take that vaccine. It could have very serious side effects. And so there was a medical exemption. 
That was also religious exemption. Because there are individuals that say, according to my faith, I, I'm going to rely on the immune system God gave me, and I don't want any vaccines. And they have the right to do that. Well, Mississippi, West Virginia, both of those states, by the way, have removed the religious exemption. You, you can't have an exemption. Now, some of them keep the medical. And then Maine, New York, and California, five states that have removed these exemptions, which are very close to simply requiring a vaccine. Now the question is, will Massachusetts be the sixth state? We're dealing with these two bills going through the Senate and the House right now. And then the key thing about this is, all throughout the history of America, whenever there has been a desire for a community, herd of immunity that is forced, you want to say everybody needs to be immune in this community. Now think, think with me now, reason with this. If I say, if my argument is, look, if one individual refuses to get vaccinated, It'll endanger the entire community. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What philosophy am I reasoning from? Collectivism, aren't I? Yes, because you have to recognize that, first of all, vaccines aren't 100% successful. Even if you got everybody to get the vaccine, that doesn't mean you're not going to get the disease. That's never meant that. Uh, and there are dangerous side effects to some people. No, the key, the individual must be empowered with choice and knowledge and responsibility to decide on their own if they want to get that vaccine. See, because that's individuality. It does not endanger the rest of the community. No, those things you have to recognize because we all have immune systems. And once someone is sick, then we deal with making them well in any way we can, from prayer to doctors to any other aspects we need to use. It's a fallacy to deal with this community-wide, these bills. What's these bills are immunity for the community, as they call them because the idea here is to force them. Now, let's be very clear. Uh, first vaccine was uh, in, uh, inaugurated by Cotton Mather, key leading historian and, and a pastor in 1721. And yet when Cotton Mather hinted that everyone in the community should be given it, in fact, that pastors should make sure that everybody in their congregations got the vaccine against smallpox, pastors rose up everywhere opposing it. Why did they oppose it? because you cannot force someone to do that, to inject something into their body. That's a violation of individuality. It's a violation of their God-given rights. Even though that started with a pastor, then other pastors rose up. You know, in 1798, all the pastors in Boston formed a society in 1798 that said, we will never submit to forced vaccines. The church rose up and said, this is not the answer. Not that all vaccines are bad or have had no positive results, not at all, but at the same time, it's the forced idea. See, the principle of individuality means that there's liberty of conscience. It is liberty under law. It doesn't mean I can do anything I want. There are things that I could do that would openly and aggressively, purposefully danger, endanger my neighbors. For instance, let me give you an example, a very practical one. If my septic system overflows and flows into my neighbor's yard, would you agree I have a responsibility to clean up that septic system and I have a responsibility to clean up whatever I damaged in my neighbor's yard? Would you agree? That's, that's very practical. I've done that. However, at the same time, and this is how we get some of those standards in a community. And when we vote by consent, say, hey, it's better to have a standard for all septic systems to kind of avoid it. It doesn't avoid every single problem. When we vote for that, that's fine. You see, that's the problem that these laws are going to come into effect. Now, this, just so you know, historically, uh, in 1797, a pastor objected to forced vaccines, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court finally decided it in 1905. And they decided it in relation to Massachusetts uh, because Massachusetts, they said, did have the right to enforce a vaccine against smallpox because of how bad the pandemic was. But here's the idea. They couldn't enforce it. You can't go to someone's house under force with a policeman sitting there and inject someone. So it basically meant that the, the state could fine you. On 1905, that was a $5 fine. And there were individuals who refused the vaccine and took the $5 fine. But you see, the idea is the principle involved here because it's a whole different ballgame now. And uh, we want to empower the individual. That's what protects the community. And when you think of this, you recognize that in, in these bills that are going through, the reasoning is such 
people are so thinking that, you know what, oh, for the good of everyone, I just have to give up my cautions. And I just say a couple of things. You really need to study. You need to study what's in the vaccine. You need to study it. And it takes a lot of years to prove a vaccine. And so the idea is this is dangerous because if states continue a trend now, even though all these five states didn't happen in the last few months, dealing with this, you're going to have a potential national movement to require everyone having COVID-19 vaccines, or you have, if you don't have the piece of paper, you can't shop, you can't go in the stores, can't travel, all that for protection. And that's the danger if you see that that's where the tyrannical aspects come. So what do we do with this principle here? Our individual walk with God is critical. Well, how is your prayer closet? I, I constantly look at it and say, my prayer closet sometimes is my car. I'm not closing my eyes when I'm driving. But the idea, I can pray. I can pray there. I can pray in the morning. I, I, but there's a very important thing for us to guard our individual walk with God. What we as an individual could do in our homes, in our neighborhood to help someone in need. One act of kindness blesses so many people. Think of the church you attend. What ministry may be in need? How could you help where there is a need? In your city or your state, how might you stand up for individual rights? How can one person inform others? Write down, I would encourage each of you to take a piece of paper if you haven't started it already. I know you're writing out all those essays and some of you are gonna send them in to me. But the point is, no, if you look at this, you should be write, writing down what are the key lessons that stand out that you've been learning by going through this study so that you can teach it to somebody else. If you write it down and say, what would I say to someone as an individual? Well, how was that? What is that fax course anyway? What's that about, F-A-C-S? What does that stand for? Well, you might say, well, it stands for Fundamentals for American Christians. What's that mean? Uh, go look at one of the videos. No, individually expressing it is a critical thing. Ask God how you might share the truths with at least one other person. Watch God use individuality. You know, as we close this session, we look at this and we say, gee, um, this lesson 11, there's an uh, article that has been given to you called Faith and Works by Russ Walton, that at the individuality, how faith is uh, complemented by works. Ponder the PowerPoint slides, slides of course. Uh, ponder these things because God is doing a great thing. And this is what uh, God is teaching us.